Hello again. This is Math 1120 coming to you from the College of DuPage, and this is the conclusion of the lecture entitled Conditional Probabilities and the General Multiplication Rule. As always, please be an active learner as you watch these videos. When we closed last time, I left you doing this problem. Uh, if you did it, uh, congratulations. If not, you have another opportunity to do it. You know what to do. Let's see how you did. So what we were supposed to do was uh, calculate the probability that a baby weighs 8 pounds, 13 ounces or more, given that they are preterm. Well, by our definition, then, we put the probability of preterm in the denominator, and in the numerator, we take the probability that it, the baby weighs 8 pounds, 13 ounces or more, and is preterm. And so from the uh, information given in the problem, that's a ratio of uh, 0 0.0022 divided by 0 0.127, and that's approximately this number, which is a little bit more than 1%, but not 2%. So... If 100 uh, preterm babies were randomly selected, you would expect about two to weigh uh, more than eight pounds, uh, well, eight pounds, 13 ounces or more. And this is an usual outcome because it is less than 5%. And now, uh, since we do have a definition that the probability of F given E is equal to the probability of E and F divided by the probability of E. If I multiply both sides by the probability of E, it cancels out on this side. So I have the probability of E and F is equal to the probability of F given E times the probability of E. And you see this is different than what we had before uh, because before we had a multiplication rule that said if events E and F were independent, you would just multiply the probability of E times the probability of F. But this is the general rule that given um, any two events, the probability that two events, E and F, both occur is the probability of E and F is the probability of E times the probability of F given E. And you see it's just an algebra thing. And in other words, the probability of E given E and F is the probability of event E occurring times the probability of event occurring given the occurrence of event E. So we can apply that rule, that theorem, uh, to this problem. The probability that a driver who is speeding gets pulled over is 0 0.8. Uh, actually, I think it is a lot less than that, but that's what the probability is said. I think not too many people really are pulled over for speeding given how many people really speed. Uh, the probability that a driver gets a ticket given that he or she is pulled over is 0 0.9. So the question here is, what is the probability that a randomly selected driver who is speeding gets pulled over and gets a ticket? So this is the general and you know what to do. Let's see how you did. Okay, so we learned that the probability of E and F is the probability of E times the probability of F given E. So that is going to be um, 0 0.8 times 0 0.9 or 0 0.72. Now here's a more uh, complicated but very important problem. Suppose that out of 100 circuits sent to a manufacturing plant, five are defective, and sometimes the, the things you get are defective. The plant manager receiving the circuits uh, does a quality control test, but they randomly select two circuits of the hundred and test them. If both work, she will accept the shipment. She thinks they're all good. Otherwise, the shipment is rejected. What is the probability that the plant manager discovers at least one? And by the way, this is the word at least one, so you want to think about that, and we've talked about that before. One defective circuit and rejects the shipment. So this is, uh, you know what to do here. Let's see how you did. Now we're going to discuss uh, two approaches. 
but the first uh, uh, approach is just to make a tree diagram. We've talked about tree diagrams being good um, uh, before. So the first circuit is either good or defective. And then the second circuit that's chosen is either good or defective. Now, the first one, you, there are, uh, and you want to say, what's the probability the first is not defective? It is 95 out of 100 because there were 95 good and, uh, and there were uh, a total of 100. So the probability of getting the first one um, uh, good is 95 out of 100 and this is 5 over out of 100 because these have to add to 1. But then when you go to the second one you see you actually have one fewer so this is dependent on what happened with the first one. So here you would have 94 out of 99 because there are 99 good ones remaining, and there are 94 of them that are good. So that is what you get for that. And when you multiply those two numbers together, you get this. And certainly, those numbers get multiplied together because that is the general multiplication rule. Now, similarly, you can go good and bad and get this one. And in fact, the only time you, uh, you, reject, um, the, um, uh, you reject if... Uh, if at least one defective circuit. And so you say, what's the probability there's at least one defective? Well, that's the probability of good and defective, plus the probability of defective and good, and double defective. So you see, these are disjoint states of nature. And so you add these probabilities up, and you can find out that this is the probability of it getting at least one defective. And this is the exact, uh, is the, uh, an exact answer. But another approach, and a smarter approach, less calculation, would be uh, to use the rule of complements that we learned. So the probability at least one defective is 1 minus the probability that none are defective. And the probability that none is defective is the probability the first is not defective times the probability the second is not defective, given the first is not defective. And you get this. And you see you do get uh, the, uh, the same answer for this, and of course you would. So this is the probability that the shipment is not uh, accepted. Now, Statistics has many things that are called rules of thumb, and whenever a small random sample is taken from a very large population, uh, you can sometimes assume that, uh, that the probability of the events are independent, and we're going to consider this example. So in a study to determine whether preferences for self are more or less prevalent than preferences for others, researchers first ask individuals to, to identify the person who is most valuable and likable to you. Uh, and said another word, your favorite other. Of uh, 1,519 people surveyed, 42 picked themselves as their favorite other. Um, I don't know if I like that or not, but that's what they say. And this was actually published in a peer-reviewed journal. Okay, so suppose you so randomly select one of those people. What's the probability that he or she chose himself or herself as their favorite other? And we have other questions. If two evangelists are charged, what's the probability that they both chose themselves as their favorite other? And uh, we want uh, to compute these probabilities, assuming appendance and not independence, and see what really happens. And what we're going to be after is, is really seeing why this, uh, this rule of thumb makes sense. So you know what to do. Let's see how you did. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we know that it is uh, 42 out of uh, 1519 uh, is the probability of E, where E is that they like themselves better than anybody else. So we get that. So the probability of E1 and E2, there are two different people who do this, is the probability of E1 times the probability of E2. Now note that this is... Um, uh, dependent probability because uh, the next time you pick there's only 41 people who have that capability uh, who have that self-love uh, and uh, but now you have 15 uh, 18 but you see these two numbers actually are very close together both the numerator and the denominator are very close together and so these uh, the, but this is the exact answer you multiply those together and you round it off and you get this but now uh, so that's that's what we did. But now if we assume uh, uh, independence, 
we're going to assume that they're both 42 over 1519. And you see this number, even though it's different, is not very different. And this, in a sense, justifies that rule of thumb that we were talking about. And here is it more formally. Um, if a small random sample are taken from large but finite populations without replacement, it is reasonable to assume independence of the event. The rule of thumb is if the sample size is less than 5% of the population size, you can treat the events as independent. So in the example that we were studying, the sample size was 2, so 2 out of this is only 0.13%, which is way less than 5%. So you can, uh, you, can, you can assume independence. And now, uh, one thing that we can do is, and I think I mentioned this before, uh, but we can come up with an additional characterization of uh, two events being independent. And um, in fact, you might say, well, I thought this is what it meant all along. But anyway, two, e two events, E and F, are independent if the probability of E given F is equal to the probability of E. It didn't matter whether F happened or not. Or equivalently, if the probability of F given E is the probability of F. Now you see this, uh, this is true because if either condition and the definition is true, uh, the other is as well. And for independent events, the probability of E and F is the probability of E uh, times the probability of F. So you see uh, the multiplication rule for independent events ends up being a very special case of the general multiplication rule. Uh, and uh, I'm also uh, deploying the uh, LSA number 7 that deals with driver fatalities. Uh, the following data represent the number of drivers involved in fatal crashes in 2016 in various light conditions. And you see we've got different kinds of weather uh, that is happening. Daylight, dark, uh, dark, dawn, dusk, and other. Okay, and you answer these questions. Among fatal crashes in normal weather, what's the probability that a randomly selected fatal crash occurs at dawn or dusk? Among dawn or dusk uh, fatal crash fatalities, what's the probability that a randomly selected fatal crash occurs during normal weather? And then you can say, is the dark without light more dangerous in normal weather or in rain? And so these are three separate questions that I'm asking you to ask to answer using this data up here. And there's additional information uh, posted. This uh, learning uh, low stakes assessment uh, is posted in your syllabus tab. And if you look at the PDF upload, you'll be able to see when it is, uh, when it is due as well. Uh, in closing, now more than ever, time is precious. Each day must count. Do the math. It will make you strong. And now more than ever, take care of yourself and of each other. May God bless you all.